The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of it be grace and peace. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church.
My Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, again we give you thanks for, yet again, this sacred time and this sacred place, wherein you allow us to approach your sacred word. Speak to us beyond the page. Speak to us beyond all life, your sacred word. Let us hear your written word as your incarnate word abiding in us. Make your word living and breathing through us by the power of your spirit. Make your word efficacious, engrafted into our souls, that we might have within us the same heart and mind that was in Jesus Christ. Empowered by your word made flesh within us, send us into the world as you sent your disciples 2,000 years ago, that we might proclaim your love, your grace, that we might be the embodiment of your kingdom, that all might know who see us, who hear us, who receive blessings from you through us, that the kingdom of God has drawn near. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. In this passage, we see it paralleling something that we saw at the first part of John, excuse me, of Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. There, Jesus takes his 12 disciples and commissions them to go out proclaiming that the kingdom of God is near to heal, to offer up uh, uh, help for the poor, to proclaim the love of God, to make that love known by lifting up the marginalized, by reaching out in concern for others so that they might know that the kingdom of God has drawn near. And here we see G Jesus doing the same thing. He's commissioning his disciples, but he's also commissioning 72 people. These aren't just his close apostles. These are the bulk of his followers, apparently. Everyone who follows Jesus Christ is now being commissioned to go out into the world and to do the mission of the church. It's the responsibility of everyone according to this particular passage. Here we will see that Jesus will lay out various principles for what church mission looks like, what it means to be the church in the world. Listen for the word of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. But do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town, and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has drawn near. The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, 
Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. An amazing passage, my Christian friends. Luke chapter 10 contains a concentration, if you will, of sayings which are difficult, and they were certainly difficult for the church of the first century to hear, and probably just as difficult for us here in the 21st century church, the 21st century church to hear as well. We often neglect and are uncomfortable with the, the commissioning of the 70, of the 72 here, because it, it, it shows that there is a commissioning of us as well. We, re, we have throughout history regarded the mission of the church as something for only a few specially called people. This is, this is the job of ministers and priests. This is the job of elders and deacons. This is the job of missionaries and evangelists. Those who have a special calling to do the special work for the church. That's how we've often thought of it. We tend to think that uh, the average person, the average Christian, is just the, your run of the, the run-of-the-mill, mundane, ordinary Christian. And that all of Christianity is primarily being done by the professionally called Christians of a sort. But this passage shows us something else, my Christian friends. This passage shows us that Jesus sent out not just the twelve, as we saw in chapter 9, but he sent out all of his followers. Or at least that's implied. Today, for the most part, the church has abandoned its mission. I'll say that. Now, I'm not necessarily saying we have as First Presbyterian Church, but it is obvious that we're not doing as much as we can. No church ever does. Now, I'm not laying a heavy burden on you. I'm just saying that Jesus Christ calls us to recognize that each and every one of us has a special role to play. It's not just the job of the pastor or the choir or the DCE. It's not just the special job of, of the people that do special work in the church. We all have special gifts. We are all blessed by God. We're all called by God. We're all sent by God to live in the world. And if we are the embodiment of the kingdom of God, as I will submit to you in this passage we are, we must go out into the world and not just be the kingdom of God in our own private homes or within the four walls of this church. We live in the world, and we are meant to be the kingdom of God in the world so that the statement is true when Jesus says, Remember this, the kingdom of God has come near. It's near because it abides in you, my Christian friends. Take a look at the passages that we see here. There are, there are, there are various principles that Jesus gives us for church ministry, if you will. In verse 2, he says, The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. Jesus affirms that the world needs the church's mission. Jesus is acknowledging that the, church, that, that, that the world needs us. The world needs what God is offering. He affirms the world's need for this mission. There is more work to be done than there are laborers to do. There, uh, we look at the world we, and we talk about the problems that are out there. That the world could use a little goodness. Well, unfortunately, there's just not enough goodness among us to go around, is there? Which means that we can't spare to hold back any. We need to be out there in the world making Christ's love known. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus says. In verse 2, he also says, Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Jesus commissions his disciples, he commissions his fellow Christians, and affirms the importance of prayer in the support of the church's ministry. Prayer, can, we can't do this without praying to God. The task is too, moment, uh, too monumental without the help of prayer. Remember, we are 
praying for an answer to the problems in the world. We often do. We gather here in the church and we pray that God respond to the evils we see in the world, the problems we see in the world, the poverty, the, the hurt, the suffering in the world. And Jesus is telling us we're part of the answer to that prayer. We are answered prayer, you and me, my Christian friends. We need to remember that. In verse 3, Jesus says, go on your way. Go on your way. The church's mission demands the, the active participation of us. It's not enough for us just to sit back and say, gee, I certainly do wish everybody well out there. Jesus sends us on the way. He wants us engaged in the world in whatever ways we can. Now, not all of us can do the same as others. Not all of us have the abilities as others. But we can do something. We can all do something. Go on your way, Jesus says in verse 3. Also in verse 3, he says, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. The message is getting a little harder here now, my Christian friends, if it wasn't hard enough in sending us out. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Jesus' commission warns of the dangers that we face. And he provides a certain guideline. Jesus is counseling us. He's, he's consoling us. He is... Uh, showing us in sincerity and the, the vulnerability that we have uh, that non-resistance as a means of uh, turning aside from danger and, uh, and anger is something that we have to avoid. We, we, can't, um, we can't just resist the world because it's dangerous. We can't just take shelter within the, 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 uh, the frame of this church, within the sanctuary walls, Thus the term sanctuary, because we feel safe here. But we can't take, uh, take our refuge here. We have to go live out into the world. The world's a dangerous place. It's an angry place. It's a resistant place. It's a place that does not always welcome the love of God. It's a place that does not always welcome the peace of God. It does not always welcome the kingdom of God. But that's precisely why we need to be there, to be present in a world which will push back on us. Verse 4, Jesus says, Greet no one on the road. Now, Jesus is not calling us to be antisocial. Put it in the context of everything he's just said. Jesus is calling us to a singularity of purpose, a recognition that there really is, that among all the other good things that we do, there is certainly this one good thing. God comes first. The kingdom of God is at hand. The, con the kingdom of God comes first. The love of God is primary. To, to quote the, uh, the theologian Soren Kierkegaard, uh, who is also a, uh, the father of existentialism, he said uh, in talking about uh, that statement that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount about uh, blessed are the pure in heart, he says purity of heart is to will one thing. And what we will is the kingdom of God, the love of God. That's our mission. Jesus says in verses 5 and in 9, he says... Uh, you're supposed to say this wherever you go to the people, peace to, you, to this house, or the kingdom of God has come to you. Let people know that God is at work in what you're doing. Let people know that you want his love known through you. Jesus' commission specifies the purpose of our mission. That's what we're there for. We're there to bring peace. We are there to bring love. We are there to bring compassion. We are there to be a sign of God's kingdom. We must declare what God is doing and bring God's peace and love to whomever will receive it. One way to do this is sharing table fellowship, he's going to say, with whomever receives the peace, the love that we will have. He says, this is verses 7 and 8. He says, eat what is set before you. Now, Jesus is speaking to uh, his... his uh, his disciples, his followers, are, are Jewish. And so he's well aware that they are going to be going into non-Jewish territory, and they're going to be, whenever they are welcomed as strangers into the loving homes of people who would welcome them, that when they uh, serve you, you need to be receptive of what they're offering. The, these Jews, of course, want to keep kosher, but not everybody they're visiting is going to serve them kosher food, Jesus is saying. There's another way of saying be adaptable to somebody else's culture if you're making the love of God known. 
If you're being the kingdom of God, recognize that the kingdom of God is larger than your culture. Eat whatever is set before you. The host, the host sets the context for our witness, not the guest, not us. In effect, if we are going to make Christ's love known, we have to do so in a way that people of different cultures, different ethnicities, different languages, different ways, will understand it, will receive it, will be blessed by it. We have to be flexible. We are not to seek a uh, or to dictate the menu. Uh, we're not supposed to uh, impose our cultural background on others. That's unfair. The kingdom of God is much broader than my culture. Jesus also says, when they do not welcome you, recognizing that that's going to be the faith now and then, he says this in uh, verse 10, Jesus recognizes the reality that we will not always be successful. He knows we're going to fail sometimes. He knows that disciples can't always be successful. And that's one of the myths we live by. We think, well, if God's on our side, we cannot fail. The simple truth is the world pushes back. The world doesn't want sometimes what God is offering. The world doesn't want to hear about Jesus Christ. It doesn't want to know the love of God. No one is telling you to uh, preach a hellfire sermon that is going to turn people off. Just show people what God's love looks like. Just be loving. Do kindness. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly with God, as Micah says. That's a good enough witness. Jesus knows that we will meet resistance and rejection some of the time. He knows this. In verse 11... He says, Shape, uh, when, when, uh, when you are rejected, when you fail, when you are not welcome, do this. Verse 11, shake the dust from your feet. Shake the dust from your feet. He said that back in chapter 9. He's saying it here in chapter 10. He said it to the 12 when he sent them out. He's saying it to everyone else when he sends them out. Jesus admonishes us to persevere. He's saying that just because we meet with resistance, just because we meet with evil and hatred in the world... Don't give up. That's exactly what resistance and anger and hatred and evil want for you, the kingdom of God, to give up. Don't give up. Just shake the dust from your shoes and admit that this case was a failure, that someone just did not want to reciprocate your love with love. Just shake the dust from your shoes, he says. Don't let failure keep us from the mission, my Christian friends. The final thing that Jesus says in this, in this commission of these, six, these 72 people that he sends out is this. And this is verse 11. Know this, he says. Know this. The kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. It may not feel like it, but the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus gives us a word of assurance he wants us to know that in all the failures that we're going to encounter, all the bad news that you and I see out there in the world, and there's a lot out there to see, I hear it often, I see it often. Given the fact that, that we're going to see this, he's giving us a word of assurance about the fulfillment of God's redemptive mission. God is still at work, even when it doesn't look like it. If the world is reluctant to see or to receive the kingdom of God... I want to say to you, my Christian friends, as Jesus is saying to them, take heart. Don't give up. The kingdom of God is near. Let not your hopes fade, my Christian friends. If we despair, then we have not gazed far enough ahead to see the kingdom of God, to see the love of Jesus Christ. We're letting the world defeat us when we know that God loves us. If we think our ministry, or if we think the ministry of Jesus Christ, has failed, we have not yet looked deeper within our own souls. The kingdom of God resides within us. The kingdom of God is so near to us as the veins in our necks. The kingdom of God is so near to us as our own breath. In every lamentation, when we look at the world, we lament, we mourn how terrible things are, and I hear it often. 
and every lamentation that passes our lips when we say, woe is me, woe is the world, remember this, when we say these things, within us is a promise, a promise of hope that is still living and breathing within our souls, my Christian friends. It's only because, and follow this metaphor, it's only because you and I are standing on solid ground <clears throat> that our feet are able, that, that our feet are on that solid ground that we are able to recognize the terrifying chasm that's in front of us. It's because we're standing on level soil that we can see the hole in front of us, the Grand Canyon in front of us. Just because we have a chasm in front of us doesn't mean we're not standing on solid ground. In fact, it's because we're standing on solid ground that we can see it. It's only because our eyes are meant to behold light that we are able to recognize that there's darkness ahead. There's fearsome darkness. We wouldn't know that there is darkness in the world if we did not have eyes that see with light. That's good news. I'm showing you, yes, there's bad out there, but there's good to be had out there, and it's in us. It's only because our souls know what love is, our souls know what the love of God is, what the compassion of God is, that we are able to recognize the dreaded evil that's in the world. We see the evil out there because we know what goodness and love are. God lives within us. We know this. And so whenever we lament about how terrible the world is, my Christian friends, and it is terrible, and, no, and, and you know, I hear people lamenting that the world is just getting, getting even worse. It's time for Christ to return. I'll tell you someday he will, but it's not because the world is any worse than it has ever been. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not because the world is any worse than it ever has been. When has the world not been bad? When has there not been evil? When, there, when has there not been suffering, my Christian friends? It's the way of the world. But be blessed by the fact that you see it because it means that there is still goodness and it abides in you. Yes, there is a chasm in front of us, but we have within us the means to cross it. Yes, there is darkness in the world, but you and me, my Christian friends, are the light of the world. As Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, as Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5, 14. Yes, there is evil. There is suffering in the world. And it's everywhere. But the promise of grace abides in you. There is a promise living in you right now, and that promise is the kingdom of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the compassion of God. It's in you. Lament the darkness. Lament the darkness. When you look ahead, yes, my Christian friends, you look ahead, you see dark days. There will always be dark days. Always. Lament those dark days. But rejoice that you can see it. And the only reason you can see it is because of the hope that lives within you. For to see it is to be the light of the world. And you are that light. We, my Christian friends, are the light because Christ, who <coughs> because Christ, who says that he is the light of the world, he says that in John chapter 8, he abides within us. He is the promise that lives within us. He is the kingdom abiding within us. This is why the kingdom of God is near, because it's in your breaths. My Christian friends, as you go out into the world, you don't need to be a Peter or Paul. You don't need to be a James or John. You don't need to be a great prophet or evangelist. But I promise you, just living your life as the kingdom of God before the world is going to be the calling that God has put before you. It makes you a missionary. Go out into the world Make Christ's love known, even in the simplest things you do. Do this because a promise lives within you. Do this because the kingdom of God has drawn near.
Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. as with one voice reaffirm our Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, once again we come before you, seeking the, the need of your kingdom to abide in us, seeking the need of your Son, Jesus Christ, to be a reality within us. Grant to us your Holy Spirit as you commission us as your missionaries for the world. Send us into the world with whatever gifts we have with, with whatever means you have blessed us by, that all might know your love and compassion, that we might be able to, in our humble way, to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, to lift up the impoverished, to be a voice for those who have no voice, to be hope for those who have no hope, to be the kingdom of God for those who do not know love and grace. Help us to be that as you have called us to do so. 
Help us to be encouraged even when we despair. Help us to realize that the chasm before us we can cross, that the darkness before us is not so dark that we can't shine as a candle in its darkness. We pray that your love will overcome and allow us to prevail against all darkness and evil, all anger and resentment and rejection that presses against us. We pray that by your strength, even in our failures, we can prevail. Remind us that there is no sin in failure. There is only a sin when we surrender ourselves to the darkness and the anger and the resentment and rejection that the world would have for us. Help us to prevail beyond all these dangers that we might be your people, that we might be your disciples, that we might be your loving kingdom to all whom we encounter. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. He who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Go in peace with this free people. Serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always.